All right, good afternoon, everybody. Today for our ACOM seminar, we have Daniele Visioni from Cornell University. Um, just a little background on Dan before we get started. Uh, he's in Doug McMartin's group as a research associate, and um, his research focuses on sulfate geoengineering, including the impact of volcanic eruptions. Um, and I think I would say he seems to really sit at the nexus of aerosol and circulation coupling, fundamental aerosol physics, surface impacts, and even geoengineering strategies. So really one of the people working on the full pipeline of this, this topic area. He's also the co-chair fittingly of GeoMIP and engages in a lot of collaborative work with our lab, including in the Wacom group. Um, so before I hand everything over to Dan, um, the way we'll do this, we've got some folks in the meeting who can ask questions directly. And we will um, also uh, take questions through Slido at the end. Um, with that, Dan, take it away. Thank you so much. Thanks. Um, and thanks for the invite again. Uh, so in particular, some thanks to the people at Anchor that have always been amazingly nice to me since I was a PhD student, Simone, Yaga, and Mike in particular, but everyone else. And then my group and all the people I had the privilege to collaborate with. So yes, today I'd like to uh, give a bit of an overview on stratospheric aerosol geoengineering um, and mostly focusing on understanding what the uncertainties are when it comes to modeling geoengineering and giving a bit of an idea of how we can move forward and reduce some of these uncertainties. So as a, some context, I will talk about uh, stratospheric aerosol injection or geoengineering. I'll call them a bit both, depending on um, depending on the moment. Uh, but why do we talk about SAI and what is SAI? And then what we can learn from the current simulations that are part of KIMIP 6 that we run with GeoMIP. And then how do we narrow down stratospheric uncertainties a bit more when we talk about the uncertainties that are tied to SAI? So. The context, of course, um, we're all doing this, uh, thinking about it, discussing about climate change. In particular, this is uh, on the left, you can see the net CO2 emissions as they are up to, all the way to the present, the black line, and then the future scenarios that are part of the SSP database. So they've been used to inform um, KIMIP 6 and the AR6. And there's definitely a wide range of possible scenarios for the future. On the right, you can see the amount of warming uh, of the global mean warming that would be produced by each of those. Uh, there's clearly some outlier ones where the warming is way above five degrees, uh, over five degrees or around five degrees. One can argue how unrealistic they are, but um, at the same time, there are some that we see at the bottom of the figure where the warming tries to uh, manages to stay below two degrees. And those are the, in a way, the important ones because the the Paris Agreement kind of forced most countries, if not all countries, to work to stay below, well below two degrees and possibly 1.5 degrees. But, um, and then there's everything in between. But when we look in particular at the scenarios that would be necessary to follow to get to 1.5, uh, and this is a more slightly more updated figure from 2020 and also has emissions from 2021, we can see that we're definitely it would one would be hard pressed to define our path, our current pathway as one that is following a scenario that would lead us to 1.5 degrees. Um, and in particular, another thing to notice is, to notice in this figure is that um, uh, most of these scenarios, if not almost all of them, do consider by 2050 a lot a large amount of negative uh, CO2 emission. So uh, a way to remove directly remove CO2 from the atmosphere. Uh, as, so as to stay below 1.5 with minimal overshoot. And so going back, um, going back to this, one can imagine how hard it is to imagine an actual scenario, at least in the short term, where we manage to do that. And this is useful to understand in the context where it's here on the right, you see an amber diagram. So this is also from the IPCC showing that risk is not, does not come in thresholds. Uh, there is not a risk that is completely non-existent in 1.5, and then it exists at 2 or 2.5. Uh, for the most part, risk is a um, continuum on, in the spectrum. So the more warming we have, the more risk we have. And 
these can be associated with different kinds of risks, uh, threatened systems, extreme weather events. So it does make sense in this framework to think um, about possible other ways in which if we don't manage to stay below 1.5 or even if we maybe manage by, by the end of the century and so we end up overshooting, um, it makes sense to ask if there could be other ways in which temperatures could be kept down and so risk from climate change could be kept down as well. And this is where um, solar radiation modification or climate engineering or geoengineering comes in. Comes in. This figure is from a report that came out last year from the National Academy of Science, Engineering and Medicine that had some recommendations for research uh, and research governance into the topic of geoengineering. So geoengineering also by the IPCC is defined as the deliberate modification of the Earth's climate to the reflection of a portion of incoming solar radiation, mainly in order to reduce some of the risk produced by global warming. Uh, here there are three, the three main methods that have been discussed and proposed. I'm not going to talk about uh, MBC or marine cloud brightening or cirrus cloud thinning now, but just about um, stratospheric use. They use a stratospheric aerosol. So SAI, stratospheric aerosol injection, is the solar radiation modification done through the injection of sulfate, sulfate aerosol precursors in the stratosphere. And this is to mimic the effect of explosive volcanic eruptions. So we've known for quite a while, and it was actually one of the first successful prediction of climate models, that when there's a big volcanic eruptions like Pinatubo in 1991, um, there is an observable surface cooling. This mainly happened because um, vol volcanoes, especially big volcanic eruption, managed to inject a large amount of SO2 uh, directly in the stratosphere, so above the tropopause, um, where the lifetime of particles and gases is actually much higher because there's much less turbulence, the atmosphere is stratified, and so um, the general circulation is much slower. Um, what happens when this SO2 is, uh, reaches the stratosphere is that rea it reacts with OH and it produces, it oxidizes and it produces um, sulfuric acid gases. Um, this H2SO4 then, it coagulates, given the temperature and the presence of water vapor um, in the stratosphere, it coagulates uh, or nucle it nucleates into novel um, liquid aerosols or it coagulates into pre-existing particles. Um, and we've seen from, again, volcanic eruptions that the particles that are formed are roughly alpha, uh, alpha micron in, in size, which is exactly the perfect size in a way for them, for these particles to reflect part of the incoming solar radiation. Um, again, this has been observed. There can be a discussion over what was the actual magnitude of the warming during Pinatubo, of the cooling during Pinatubo, because it was just a one-off event. And also we didn't have great information in many ways. We had good information, but not great information. Uh, but this is definitely something we know happened. And we also observed how these particles uh, not only reflect part of the incoming solar radiation, but they also absorb part of the infrared radiation. And so they warm the stratosphere. So this is the context. Uh, already many scientists in the past, some scientists in the past had um, discussed this, but definitely Paul Cruzen in 2006 had a paper out in climatic change discussing how in case um, mitigation, the mitigation failed in the short period, um, an artificial injection of SO2 could be seen as a way to solve the conundrum and reduce risk from climate change. And again, it's important to understand that when we do research into uh, SAI, we're not claiming that it is a substitute for emission because it is not. So we cannot imagine uh, an increase em that emissions keep growing and there are any scenario and we just use whatever form of geoengineering to bring temperatures down for many reasons. First of all, because we're not treating the underlying causes because there's a lot of effects that are just due to CO2 that we wouldn't be um, impacting. And second of all, because we're committing ourselves to cooling more and more, the more we inject, the more, the more CO2 we inject. And so the risk of eventual, an eventual termination, so and a termination risk, if temperatures then go back up too fast, that's also there. So the, one of the main ideas in which we should really consider SAI research is as a temporary, again, as I keep saying, as a temporary way to bring down temperatures, as you see in this um, figure on the right, um, where emissions are cut, this is the main thing. Some CO2 is also removed um, at one point during the century, but while these things happen, um, SAI is used to 
keep temperatures at a certain temperature target, whatever it is. So in the last IPCC report, um, and a working group through three that came out last week, um, SRM is mentioned in a few places. And the thing that struck me while I was uh, reading the report was that um, one of the things that the IPCC report most focuses on is on the uncertainties that are tied to solar radiation modification. In the most of the passages, it always says it could potentially cool the planet rapidly at low direct costs, but it, uh, it entails uncertain side effects. Um, understanding the climate response to SRM remains subject to large uncertainties significant uncertainties. Um, large uncertainties still exist for climate processes. So it's kind of one of the main uh, point is that it exists as an idea. It doesn't exist or as a technology yet, but it does exist as an idea. And the, it looked like from the FCC report that the main obstacle to, these is the, to, to considering this is the uncertainties that are tied to the climate response that it would have. But when we talk about uncertainties, we're actually talking about a lot of different things, especially when it comes to SAI. Um, and so this is kind of an idea of what kind of uncertainties is SAI research supposed to answer? So the first one is would SAI, so would injecting these stratospheric aerosols, this SO2 actually reduce global temperatures? What side effects would it produce? How would it interact with stratospheric dynamics, with stratospheric chemistry? Uh, and then what would the regional surface impacts be? So there, there could be stratospheric impacts, but also surface impacts. So it wouldn't turn back the, the clock and so bring back the temperature at exactly as it was in the pre-industrial or whatever temperature target. But what would the actual regional, regional surface impacts be? And fourth, uh, are there ways in which one could imagine doing SAI that could actually minimize all of these arcs? And then of course, there are also societal and political uncertainties that not going to consider here, but they're also very important. So I'm just focusing on the one that we can investigate through modeling. And these uncertainties that are listed here, they are also all connected to one another. They cannot be considered independently. The more SO2 you need, uh, the larger the perturbation. So we need to know roughly how much we would need so that we can understand how much aerosols that would be in the stratosphere and how much the stratosphere would warm and what, side, what the side effects would be. Um, the side effects would be coupled to the regional surface impacts because the stratosphere and the troposphere are not um, disconnected. So how does the stratospheric heating couples with changes in surface climate? Can we understand that? And finally, can we think of injection strategies that would minimize the impacts? But to do that, so to try to better understand whether there are specific latitudes or time of years where it would make sense, we really need to have a strong understanding of both <clears throat> the stratospheric side effects, but also the regional surface impacts. Um, and so, and there are many more connections. So before it, this turns into uh, a madman uh, board, uh, I'm just gonna try and give you an idea of what the current um, climate models that have performed uh, SAI and geoengineering experiments uh, can tell us. So in particular, um, in KIMIP-6, uh, as part of the geoengineering model intercomparison project, there are simulations of SAI that have been proposed, and there are up to now six models that have carried them out. In particular, the scenario that is considered here is one where there are two scenarios considered. The SSP 5 at 5, which is a very high emission scenario. Again, one of those that one might consider unrealistic, but useful here just to understand a very high radiative forcing. And then there's SSP 245, a middle of the road scenario that is probably the one that is following current pledges the most. So with a um, pretty bit more realistic scenario. And the idea um, is to consider whether one could use SRM to bring temperatures down considering an SSP 585 to those that we would have under an SSP 245 scenario. So we have higher CO2 concentrations, but we try to use to modify the incoming solar radiation to make sure that temperatures are down to those on an SSP 245 scenario. And this can be done, it is done in the models in two ways. The first one is through a solar constant decrease. So we just go in the model and reduce the amount of uh, incoming solar radiation by some fraction of a percent. Um, and that has been done because it's the simplest thing to do because previously lots of models did that and it can tell us a lot of interesting thing when we compare it against the other experiments where we actually inject SO2, in this case, between 18 and 20 kilometers and between 10 north and 10 south. 
And so we have these now four experiments to look at. We have the two SSP scenarios, and then we have an experiment where the solar constant is turned down to cool the planet, and an experiment where the aerosols are cooling the planet in the model. And this is just to give you an idea of the results. These are the six models um, that have uh, performed these experiments. Just zooming out. Oops. Okay. Just zooming out on CSM2, Wacom, for instance, uh, this is what happens in the model. Uh, so you have higher temperatures in SSP585. Here you can see, in the case of Wacom, of CSM2, Wacom, the warming in SSP585 compared to 2020 is over four degrees. In SSP 245 is roughly two degrees. So there's a two degrees difference. And the red and the blue line are actually the, the two geoengineering experiments. So in terms of global mean temperatures, we can find a way, and again, we can find a way in all of the models to actually reduce surface temperatures. But here you can already see that, um, where is the uncertainty here? Well, first of all, the main uncertainty is that the models project a different amount of warming in the two scenarios independently of geoengineering. Um, so from this, for, from this figure, actually, you cannot see the uncertainties related to geoengineering. But that's not because there are none, but it's mostly because that's by design. So another way to look at this is this way. Um, under climate change, there are uncertainties to CO2 increase. So if we have scenarios that are designed to have a certain CO2 concentration, then the large uncertainty that we see is mostly in the sensitivity of the planet. So how much is it warming depending on the CO2 that we're emitting? Um, and these are, um, in turn brings that leads to uncertainties over the projected impact. If you do, uh, if you simulate geoengineering, of course, there are going to be no uncertainties to the intervention when it comes to global mean temperatures, because that's exactly what we're doing. But for instance, there are going to be uncertainties just in other places. So in a way, the uncertainties are just shifted from the surface or from the general sensitivity of the planet to the sensitivity to a specific parameter, in this case, stratospheric optical depth. And you can see here at the bottom right that the changes in global stratospheric AOD that are, that are necessary in the model to offset that warming are really different. They are as different, if not, if not more different, than the uncertainties in climate sensitivity shown uh, by the models. And the reason for these are multiple. But of course, um, the main one is really that the models are injecting all in the same way. They're following the same exact strategy. But there are large differences in how the stratospheric carousel are distributed in the stratosphere. So you can see in the uh, and, and in the left, you can see the zonal mean stratospheric KOD, so just longitudinally dependent uh, in the various models. And there are large uncertainties, especially in the tropics. We have one of the model UKSM that has three times as much um, AOD than some of the other models. But also at high latitudes, we have large differences, again, between uh, some, some of the models and the others. And the amount of SO2 that the models need to get to that AOD, it's also very different. So uh, there are so these are some of the um, differences that all together play out. So we're not really comparing like with like, as in as if when we're doing CO two uh, concentration driven simulations, and we can tell that we have the same amount of CO two, uh, and we can just look at the differences in the radiative forcing. In this case, we also have a problem where the SO two gets um, reacts and produces H2SO4 and produces these aerosols, but the, the size and the distribution and the interactions of these aerosols are different between models. But overall, um, the, the question that everyone wants to know and the question we are trying to answer is also what the surface impacts would be. So and it's interesting always to try to understand what are we comparing against when, when we discuss um, about these surface impacts. So for instance, here we have, here I have another figure done with the same models, but just trying to compare um, what happens in the differences that we have under climate change and the difference that we have under geoengineering, both for temperatures and for precipitation. And of course, again, this, temp this figure doesn't tell us much about the uncertainty. This is just the model average. So all the uncertainties that are in the stratosphere are kind of hidden because we're looking at the surface. And from just this figure, one could say that, well, 
it's pretty obvious that the plot on the right, on the right when we do geoengineering, uh, look better in terms of warming and maybe a little bit better in terms of precipitation um, than the, the than the plots on the left. But again, um, this way we're kind of avoiding the question of what are the uncertainties tied to these projections that we're seeing here. This is another way to see these same results, but in this case, we compare um, the case were with much more warming. So SSP 585 versus SSP 245, and then the two geoengineering cases. So sulfur, the injection of sulfur minus SSP 245 and the, the reduction in solar constant and SSP 245. And on the right, we can see the multimodal standard error. So in each grid box over the 20 years that we're considering here towards the end of the century, what is the spread, the, the regional spread between the models? And here we can start seeing where these uncertainties lie when we do the projection, when we do our projections. So focusing on just the bottom ones, this is the case in which all the models do the same exact thing in the simplest of ways. So they just reduce uniformly the, the surface, uh, the, the, the top of the atmosphere incoming solar radiation in the same way. And the models also show, so kind of a good agreement, um, first of all, in the panel on the left, they show that it looks like temperature is mostly uniform cool. So the planet is almost uniformly uh, much similar to the SSP245 case. But also, aside from some areas, so very high latitudes in the Northern Hemisphere and parts of Africa, it looks like the models kind of tend to agree over the, the response. Now, of course, when we move to the second case, so where we actually have the aerosols, um, First of all, we see that there are large, there are some differences uh, on the plot of the left between in the in the surface temperature. So we don't have the same uniform cooling, and there are some much more visible differences between the case where we're injecting the aerosols and the case where temperatures are lower because there's less CO2. But also we can see that the multimodal standard error increases, and not just in the places where it was high. Um, in the case of the solar experiment. So a large, larger part of the, of, the, of the Northern Hemisphere show much higher standard error, but also some part in the Southern Hemisphere show a larger standard error. So it means that the models tend to disagree more. So we can consider the uncertainty in this way. So we don't know which model is right in this case, but we can see that models tend to disagree more. So uncertainties um, can be considered also in this way. And again, one way to understand why there is this increase in uncertainty between um, the solar case and the sulfur case, it goes back to the differences in the zonal mean stratospheric KOT. If you don't have the same way to reflect the solar radiation, it is, it, it is obvious that there are gonna be differences in the surface climate. If you have less aerosols at high latitudes, the high latitudes are gonna be warmed more because you're not reflecting that much solar radiation. If you're have most of your aerosols in the tropics, that's the part that's gonna be cooled more. So if you have to achieve the same global mean temperature because we do that by design, then we start having large differences, larger differences between the models. One other, another way that we've tried to investigate in particular this, um, this effect. So what is the difference between when we turn down the sun, which is something that again, um, other climate models uh, and multiple past experiments have done um, and what are the effects when we actually have the aerosols? We've done it in CSM1 Wacom uh, in some studies that we ran uh, last year. That um, And here in particular, you can see another focus on what is the actual difference between them? Well, first of all, it is pretty obvious that turning down the sun, imagining to turn down the sun uniformly over the whole planet doesn't look at all like when we're injecting aerosol close to the equator. Quite simply, the, tr the stratospheric circulation tries to keep things in the tropics near the equator. So you have a much larger buildup of aerosols um, near the equator. And so the distribution of these optical depth doesn't look at all as if when we're uniformly reducing the solar constant. And then there are also differences here. Uh, the colored line that you can see here <clears throat> are the differences depending on the month. So the stratospheric circulation is not um, the same every month of the year. So we cannot expect the aerosols to look the same every month of the year. And so if you have these differences, this is gonna to lead to differences in the surface climate as well. We ran more experiments uh, when it comes to this, again, with CSM1 Wacom, when we, we were really trying to dig a bit deeper into where the sources of uncertainties are. 
And in particular, we tried um, some turning down the sun in a way that looks a lot more like a latitudinal distribution to try to match the temperature gradients at the surface. And also we tried to include the stratospheric heating in a turn down the sun experiment so that we could really see also the difference between having the actual aerosols that change your ratio of diffuse radiation at the surface that um, interact with chemistry in another way. And so we had this set, this set of five experiments that, um, that, we, well, that we run that um, some of the Simone Tilms run and then the turning down the sun, uh, they were run in 2020. Um, and with this helped us a lot to understand what are what drives these changes in the surface. And to conclude that work, we have this kind of very complicated figure, but I think it helps illustrate how interconnected and complicated all of these interactions are. And so whenever we talk about the surface impacts, we cannot forget the impacts that are mediated by the stratospheric perturbation. So if we just re reduce the solar constant, we do not have any stratospheric heating. Um, so we just have less short wave radiation incoming at the surface. That changes surface temperatures. It changes precipitation patterns. Um, and it does change a little bit um, ecosystems in the land model. Uh, if we include the stratospheric heating, we start having a significant perturbation in terms of stratospheric of atmospheric dynamics. Um, so we have circulation changes, tropical warming that produces water vapor increase, uh, changes in the vertical temperature grading, and some changes in cloud cover that are not visible when we just turn down the sun. And again, when then we include also the aerosols, we have other changes, for instance, the stratospheric ozone. And I know Simone is going to talk about this more uh, at the end of May, so I'm not going to focus on this, but that's one of the most important things that we want to try to understand what would happen to stratospheric ozone if one were to do something like this. So overall, it's impossible to uh, talk about these uncertainties without understanding that really these uncertainties do not only play out at the surface, but also in the stratosphere. And it is fundamental to try to understand where these aerosols would really go. Oops. Okay. And lastly, just again, when it comes to uncertainties, it is also useful to always understand what are we talking about when it comes to climate change. So if we then also include in the picture the warming that we that would be projected under SSP 5 at 5, and we see that's much larger than any of the perturbation that we could produce with SAI, but also that the models also disagree, and in, a, in many places in a much stronger way than they do under any of the engineering experiments. So the uncertainties that exist when we do projection of this kind of intervention in the climate um, they must also be considered in light of what are the uncertainties that, uh, that we have when we're thinking about projection of future climate change. Um, and this is very relevant when we're trying to think through what are the risks of deciding to do or not to do uh, one thing or the other. Okay, and now the last part is how do we try to narrow down these stratospheric uncertainties? Because up to now, this has just been an observation of this is what happens and the models do different things, but trying to understand how can we get the models to agree or that is a better question than what model is right is kind of a harder question. So <clears throat> again, this is, the, this is the, in this case, the most important figure. How can we explain such a large model discrepancy? How can we explain <clears throat> such large differences in the dynamics between models and what is actually driving most of these differences. Well, so there are, and again, there are plenty of things to understand, but probably one of those that is more easily missed is that what we're simulating is in no way close to what happens either in the case of volcanic eruption or in the case of one, what, one, what one would actually do. So the smallest grade box than one could find um, in a climate model, for instance, in GSM, even when we're talking about the smallest one, we're still talking about a grid box in the stratosphere that is 100 kilometers per 100 kilometers time one kilometer high. So it's a huge box. And what we're doing to simplify, because we cannot get into the grid box and differentiate what's happening in there, is that we assume that the SO2 that we're injecting, it's all uniformly distributed in this box. 
Of course, this is going to produce large changes in what we assume the nucleation rates and the production of our cells is going to be. And this is something is not new. It's something that we see also when we're trying to analyze the results of what climate model do uh, when it comes to volcanic eruption. So I have a figure here from a paper from a PhD student that is working on this um, by analyzing results for volcanic eruptions for, for Pinatubo um, in various models that have comprehensive stratospheric aerosol chemistry and, and uh, interactive aerosol models. And you can see in black the lines that are the observations for after Pinatubo. This is for global stratospheric sulfate burden. And in the various colors that are the single models um, trying to match as much as possible the, the line that you see as we could uh, measure it. And it's pretty clear that no model gets anywhere close to correctly simulating what the fate of the stratospheric aerosols. And um, why is that? Well, one of the main reasons is that because there is no way that Pinatubo injected in such a large area. Pinatubo actually injected the SO2 over a pretty short column um, and over a pretty short time span. So what the models are doing is already a huge, um, a huge simplification of what actually what actually happened. So there's no wonder that that's what's happening. But that's not the only thing. What these models mostly differ off is not just the um, horizontal resolution or the vertical resolution or the dynamic scheme, but mostly is the stratospheric aerosol um, model. So the um, how actually the aerosols and the, the revolution is actually simulated in each of these models. And it's pretty hard to understand what the differences are when we are talking about such different models with different um, schemes and different chemistry. It's much useful if we just try to narrow down into one model and try to understand the same model with the same dynamics, the same core, everything's the same except the aerosol microphysics, which is what we did in a study that was um, uh, led by Anton Lasko and it, it published at the beginning of this year. So in this set of experiments that were done with Ekam Hammock with two different aerosol microphysics, one of them is, sex, is a sectional scheme, SALSA, and the other one is a model scheme, uh, M7. So the difference between the two is that the model, uh, a model scheme assumes that the size distribution of the aerosols are all log normals. And there can be multiple modes, but all of them are mainly um, decided by their, um, this, their standard deviation, which is fixed, and their, the, their mean radius. Uh, and the overall size distribution is just the combination of all of the distributions of the single modes. On the other hand, we have a sectional distribution, the, the sectional micro uh, scheme that is salsa, in which aerosols are considered to be in separated beans of a certain width. And the aerosols are free to move from one or the other, but there is no assumption at all over what shape the aerosol distribution is going to have. A model scheme is usually much faster because. Uh, most of the aerosols are considered to be in the same uh, internally mixed. So there's just one size distribution for all of the, spe or the aerosol species. That this usually doesn't happen in a sectional model. But in particular here, it's interesting to see what happens when you try to do injection of SO2 um, from one to 100 teragrams in both cases at the equator and what happens to the size distribution of these aerosols. So, here to try, it's a very complicated figure, but it, it's very instructive because it says a lot. So um, on the x-axis, you can see the wet diameter of the particles. And on the y-axis, you can see the size distribution. And the curves are, of course, the model mode in which we just have these curves um, that are all log normals in, in size. And then on the, we also have the bins that are from the sectional model. We also have the, the, the gray line is the maximum scattering efficiency window. So we want the particles to be there. We assume particles are going to be there, and we want them to be there for maximum efficiency. But we also have the infrared absorption as a function of size here. So we can clearly see how the two models, in, this is, again, the same exact climate models, just the aerosol microphysics changes. But there are large differences in how these two uh, aerosol schemes uh, simulate the aerosol distribution. Um, we can see, and mainly the most interesting thing here is that in the window where we, were, where we want most of the particles to be, because they absorb less, but they reflect more, there are many more particles in the sectional scheme than there are in the model scheme. Whereas when we go to particles that absorb too much and they're not really that good anymore of reflecting, 
there are much many more particles in the model scheme. And a priori, we cannot really tell which one of these two is right, simply because we do not have any kind of observation. Even when it comes to Pinatubo, we do not have observation of the size distribution in the moment of the cloud, but this is even a different experiment. The, even if it happened in the real world, here we have a continuous injection of a much smaller amount in a way every day. And so we really cannot tell just by looking at this, which one is right and which one is wrong. But it's a clear difference uh, between the two. And so if this difference is just when we change one single thing in the same climate model, what happens when we also at the same time change a lot of other things? So another way in which we can narrow down some very uncertainties is to try to go and look a bit more carefully at what happens at different latitudes when we do these kind of experiments. In particular here, we're running a set of experiments with four climate, three climate model, one in two versions. So CSM2, Wacom, UKESM, they both have pretty high top um, and model microphysics. And then we have GIS in two different versions a kind of model, more simplified model one and a bulk aerosol microphysics. So basically there's no microphysics and there's just a prescribed radius for it. And we try to inject the same amount of aerosols. So 12 teragrams of SO2 every year, um, every day of the year. And we try to do this at different latitudes, uh, at the same longitude at different latitudes. And we try then to see what happens to the distribution of the aerosols. So here, again, it's pretty clear that there are large differences um, in, in what the models see, but these differences are not always the same. So if we inject the equator, a bit like the KIMIP-6 experiments do, we can clearly see that there are much, much larger differences than if we inject slightly outside of the equator, so at 15 north. Clearly, there, is, there are differences in the simulation of the tropical pipe and on the confinement of the aerosols at the equator, how they interact with the QBO, um, that don't happen, that, and these differences play a bit of a le less uh, minor role when we inject outside of the tropical pipe. Uh, but then there are also large differences in what the aerosols are simulated to do when it comes to, to high latitudes, especially in this case, of course, the GIS bulk is the model that is kind of the outlier, but considering that it prescribed the aerosols, we can be safe in saying that you know, it's the most simplified one. Um, this figure, we can analyze it in different ways because there are different things that we might be interested in. So for instance, we can separate the problem and say, well, how much SO2 is needed to produce a certain AOD or better off here, we have the same amount of, AO of SO2 injected and it produces different AOD. So we can ask the other question, if we wanted to achieve the same exact global amount of um, AOD, how much SO2 we would need to inject? Because that is a free parameter for us. We can imagine that if we realize we need to inject five instead of 10, we can do that easily. So we can separate those two questions and then just look at the normalized AOD. So if we assume that we can tweak this parameter uh, and change the amount of SO2, then how, the, how would this um, distribution look like if we had the same global value? And here we can see that some of these uncertainties tend to be reduced. Some of them like the, the tropical distribution, they're still high. Um, there are clearly still differences, but some of them are also interestingly reduced. So there is clearly some of the some of the some ways in which we can separate these problems. And why are we, why do we have these differences? Again, there there are pretty much a lot of factors that intervene to, for this. So in particular, here we're looking at um, things like the the effective radius. So there are clear this clearly that. Um, of course, we cannot do this for the um, for the Gisbol case, but for the, these three cases, we can see that there is clearly a difference, and this difference can be up to a um, hundred percent when it comes to the simulated effective radius. So CSM tends to see much bigger particles than UKSM does. Uh, this could be due to the fact that CSM does not have an explicit nucleation mode. Um, when it comes to the size distribution, UKSM does, but clearly UKSM and GIS model have a much uh, more similar effective radius. And when it comes to the mass again, then we have um, a larger agreement between some of the models and some of the others. So there are clearly like large differences and the, the reason why we have this difference are also um, hard to understand because there are so many things playing out all at the same time. The, destiny of the, um, 
of the of the aerosol distribution depends on a lot of things. It doesn't only depend on the large scale surface of circulation. Um, it does depend on the effective of, of, of the size of the particles because gravitational settling depends on how big the particles are. It does depend, of course, on the Brewer-Dobson circulation. So if models have faster or slower Brewer-Dobson circulation, that's going to dictate how fast these aerosols disperse before uh, they get to the to high latitudes. Um, but there's also a self-lofting through the local heating. If we heat up the lower stratosphere, uh, we do have a self-lofting effect that we can see here, for instance. So the models already have in the baseline case, which is what's shown here, they already have a pretty large differences um, at some altitudes between them uh, when it comes to the vertical velocities. And this is going to drive um, how the aerosols look like in terms of the vertical profile, which is a thing that we also cannot observe if we just leave it ourselves to AOD. And also, it's important to understand what the effective size is of these particles, because all of these uncertainties interact with radiative ones. So here we see the temperature, the stratospheric temperatures in all of these models. And clearly, this is another one of the aspects where the models completely disagree with one another. Um, and again, the reason why this happens is not just because of differences in the baseline um, radiative treatment of these aerosols, but also because these aerosols look different. Their mass is different between the models, their size is different. So CSM sees an intermediate warming, um, KISS models is much more warming, UKSM sees less because the particles are smaller, and we get all the way to the point where in GIS bulk, where the particles are too small, so they destroy too much ozone and that also interacts with radiation and they do not absorb. So where we actually see stratospheric cooling instead of the warming that we would expect. So um, just this last slide and I'll try to conclude. Uh, and again, this is, I like these kind of complicated schemes, not because um, they're that useful to understand anything, but just because they're useful in highlighting how complicated everything is and how interconnected everything is. All of these physical certain uncertainties when it comes to stratospheric aerosol intervention, even without considering the surface climate, which is here on the right, but all of the other ones, so stratospheric dynamics dictates uh, the distribution and lifetime of the aerosols. But this, um, this distribution of the aerosols interacts with the radiative forcing. So it changes absorption and reflection, uh, produces stratospheric heating, which in turn changes stratospheric dynamics. Um, the aerosol chemistry and microphysics does dictate the size of these particles, um, but it also interacts with stratospheric chemistry. If we have bigger particles or more particles, we have more ozone depletion because of surface area density changes. Um, we can change OH abundance. We can change some of the greenhouse gases, for instance, water vapor in the stratosphere. So overall, um, not, it's very hard to try to treat any of and to narrow down any of these physical uncertainties uh, alone, Mo and mo mainly because we have uh, all of our models that are now fully interactive, uh, but we are trying to um, single out some of these uncertainties one by one in this way and in other ways, for instance, prescribing an aerosol, the same aerosol distribution in climate chemistry model um, could be another way to try to understand what happens to the models uh, when they have exactly the same distribution, but maybe a different radiative treatment. Um, or prescribing the, what happens if you prescribe the same exact aerosol distribution to the surface climate. How uncertainties do the projection get there? So just to conclude, um, I want to reiterate because I think it's always useful um, that SAI and studying SAI is not a claim for a solution to climate change. We're not trying to solve climate change. It doesn't treat the underlying causes which is CO2 and other greenhouse gas emission. It does not fix a lot of the problems, especially when it comes to ecosystems and ocean acidification. And it is pretty obvious that it, it works, but it's also imperfect at best. However, as we move towards temperature thresholds that we, through some processes, have deemed safe, whether it's 1.5 or any other one, the question that people and decision makers will ask is, is doing SAI safer than not doing SAI? What are the risks tied to climate change or the risk tied to doing such an active intervention. And for us, for climate science, this means facing uncertainties in our projection. Most of them are gonna be unsolvable as they are for climate change, but we can try to narrow, narrow them down. However, we need to be clear on what these uncertainties are. And in particular, 
I really want to highlight highlight how there are two different kind of uncertainties that we should treat differently differently when we discuss SAI impact. So there's one that is scenario related. It's a lot closer to the scenario me problem. Um, in that case, is what's going to happen to future economies and what's going to happen to CO two emission. In our case, is when where are we injecting the SO two? What are we injecting? Are we injecting SO2, H2SO4? There are proposals for other materials that are not sulfate-based, um, but most mainly what's our goal? Are we trying to cool to 1.5 because that's what the Paris Agreement tell us? Are we trying to halve the forcing from the CO2? Are we trying to go back to pre-industrial? When we discuss the impacts, that's a very fundamental question in, a, in trying to understand what actually are the side effects and the impacts of SAI. On the other hand, we have more mother-related uncertainties, which are the ones that we can act on and try to understand what, how to improve our models to reduce those. The aerosol distribution, so size and concentration of the aerosols, um, the radiative response in the lower stratosphere, the radiative response at the surface, and that's important uh, considering the land model and the changes in diffuse radiation that it could be at the surface. The dynamical response, so uh, what happens to the QPO in the models, what happened to the Bureau Dobson circulation, how does the circulation in general changes when you have this perturbation? And finally, the chemical processes that are included or not in the model. Not all models have comprehensive stratospheric chemistry, so not, not all models are capable to actually understand uh, what would happen to the ozone layer, for instance. Um, and this is also that important when it comes to the, to the dynamical response. So we are confident that it would be capable to reduce global temperatures, as the FCC said, and it could alleviate, alleviate some extreme impacts, but we still have large uncertainties. So again, bringing CO2 emission, it will, al will always be the safer bet for this. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Dan. That was really great. Um, so we've got time for questions um, and uh, what we'll do is bring up Slido and let the folks on the, um, on the live stream type in some answers. And while we're waiting for those questions to come in and get moderated, does anyone in the meeting on Zoom want to ask a question directly? Um, just raise your hand, we can unmute you. Or you can type in the chat too, that would work. Alternatively, if you want to wait to ask your question until after the live stream is done, you totally get that. Too. Okay, I'm gonna give it another 30 seconds um, for, okay. Slido question from Anonymous. Can you comment on the ice cloud response in those model runs? Thanks. Yes, um, that is actually one of the things that I've been very interested about. And I would definitely say that um, they're one of the messiest part. So, um, and for a lot of reasons, I, um, well, I can share, but also not share, which is fine. But so how ice clouds are simulated in the model is already complicated. Uh, in particular, what, um, what constitute an homogeneous nuclei for, um, for, for, the, for the freezing process, what constitute an heterogeneous nuclei for the freezing process. In particular, looking hardly at CSM1 Wacom simulations, what I found is that um, once these aerosols from the stratosphere settle down in the troposphere, they kind of mess up 
the aerosol population of heterogeneous nuclei in the upper troposphere. And so they, this produces changes that are not really realistic. In general, one thing that we would expect and would definitely see in plenty of models is that, of course, if you're, low, if you're heating the lower stratosphere and cooling the, the surface, you would decrease slightly the vertical temperature gradient. So the processes that bring water vapor to the upper troposphere would be slightly reduced. So a lot of uh, different models have actually observed this slight reduction in upper tropospheric clouds. However, I really feel like for this particular line of investigation, there's a lot of work that needs to be done with models to understand what of the uh, results are actually physically right and what are just a feature of the fact that we just never considered, well, that people never considered these huge amounts of stratospheric sulfate in the upper stratos stratosphere, in the upper troposphere when it comes to model um, aerosol distribution. Um, Simone, do you still have a question in the yeah. okay. Zoom meeting? Okay. Sure, I can uh, quickly ask about when you compare the different models, I should know probably, but um, and especially for the volcano comparison, um, do they have diff? I, I assume they also have very different, or, or at least vertical resolution, how they mm -hmm. uh, do the transport uh, vertically and also horizontal resolution. Is there a large gap or are they mostly all like one degree standard models currently? No, there's a large there, there's a large difference in the horizontal resolution, mostly because some of these models, in this case, they are CCM, so they're more focused on stratospheric processes. So some of them are really high. Uh, well, some of them have one or two degrees resolution, but some of them are even five or six in terms of horizontal resolution, and some of them have a much more resolved stratosphere, up to eight hundred meters in terms of vertical resolution. Some of them have. So there, these models, when it comes to the to looking at volcanoes, really have large differences. Some of them have prescribed stratospheric chemistry, so we do not see OH depletion, and we have seen how that changes um, SO2 to SO4 conversion rates. So they're, 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 uh, the more you look into model differences, the more you understand how these models are completely different in many, in many ways. Yeah, thank you. Um, let's pivot to Slido. Uh, Anonymous is asking, what do you think some of the most valuable measurements would be for constraining stratospheric aerosols and global models? Um, well, so as I was trying to show, there is, so on one hand, the very valuable and in a way easier to get measurement would be really better constrained over stratospheric circulation because the, stratospheric, the global stratospheric circulation does matter a lot when it comes to stratospheric aerosols. But when we're talking about um, aerosol microphysics, so subscale processes, the truth is that um, there aren't that many cases where we can get out and test models in a situation that is as extreme as the one where uh, we're doing any kind of uh, geoengineering. So on one hand, it would be great if we could uh, get into an volcano plume in the case of a big volcanic eruption. But even then, um, the difference is pretty big because in that case, we have, first of all, other chemical reactions happening because there's other stuff. And in an, on the other hand, um, these eruptions are either too big or too small. So there is really a question of what kind of um, information you need, need at the very small scale. And there's probably some information we could get from some very small, very limited um, actual experiments where we go out and we are able to measure um, coagulation rates and see how do the ones we measure um, match the ones that we have in the models. Uh, but it's a really hard question to understand how do we get there, there's the, the big problem that there is with, with stratospheric aerosol injection and engineering in general is that there is really a gap between what you can test and what is actually the actual climate intervention. And so there's you cannot do until you have the agreement over doing it and that we do not want to do at all right now because there are still these big uncertainties. But definitely, so I would say that in a way, the low hanging fruit, it would be to improve our stratospheric circulation so that we can get our models to match better that one. And then we can dig into the stratospheric aerosol um, at the small scale. Yeah, 
And also I would say uh, trying to think through the addition of plume models that are able to resolve some of the issues in the grid box or you're injecting, that would also be useful. All right, we'll give a little bit more time for another um, Slido question, maybe 30 seconds or so. Uh, if anyone else in the Zoom meeting wants to ask a question now, feel free. Um, just to fill the space, we don't have a seminar next week, but we have one two weeks after that. Um, so check your emails for that announcement that should come sometime this week or next. Um, okay, I think that may be probably all the questions we'll get through Slido for now. Um, so everyone, let's virtually thank Dan for giving the thank seminar you. today thank again. And thanks Dan for coming. Um, thanks everyone who asked questions. We appreciate it. See you in two weeks.